Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with Valley PBS. Today we are chatting with Brandy Carpenter of the Central California Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Gina Lu Gong of Central California Asian Pacific Women, and Victoria Bernhardt of Central California Women's Conference. They have all generously agreed to share some of their experience with us and to thank you all for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you. So women, women of color, women empowerment, women business uh, people, talk about the role of each of your organizations. Let's start with you, Brandy, and, and talk about how, you, how the organization was shaped and your agenda for today. So the Central California Hispanic Chamber of Commerce was born in 1983, and uh, it was the organizers and the founders saw that there was a need for Hispanic-owned businesses. There wasn't a voice um, for that particular segment of uh, the region. So uh, they started their Chamber of Commerce and um, here we are today, uh, still around. And really what our chamber does is we want to stimulate, obviously, economic growth for the region. Uh, we support the members that are a part of our chamber. So we are a member-based organization. and. Today, we just really want to highlight that, you know, Hispanic-owned businesses are one of the fastest growing uh, here in the business, particularly women-owned businesses, and um, just share all the great things that we do. Now, why is it so important to have a Hispanic Chamber of Commerce as opposed to uh, just being part and relying on the Chamber of Commerce that crosses all ethnic and, and racial and gender uh, boundaries. One of the forefathers is, is still here in the region and very active, um, and I've consulted with him, and he said really at that time, which we kind of find is still an issue, it, there's not really maybe programs that are in Spanish for those mm -hmm. that are more Spanish speaking. You know, we do see there's a, a difference in um, how they start their business and, right. and the education that they get. Um, sometimes it's comfort level, sometimes it's, it's pride. And so we think, you know, if we talk to them um, in a way that's, um, you know, maybe not only in their language, but just to showcase that we are here for you and we do represent. And Central California um, um, uh, Asian Pacific women have a different but similar set of, of issues with the added complexity mm -hmm that you have uh, more diverse linguistic groups mm -hmm. uh, involved. So yeah. talk a little bit about uh, your work. Sure. Central California Asian Pacific Women uh, is a nonprofit organization. It's all volunteer. I am the president of the board. And it was founded in 1980. And our mission is to empower each generation of Asian Pacific women in the Central Valley. And it's a big mission. <laughs> it's very broad. But it's purposely so because we do uh, facilitate different connections across different generations, across various ethnic groups. We are a pan-Asian organization and we're actually I think one of the few, maybe even one of the only pan-Asian organizations um, in the Valley that focuses on empowerment specifically for women. Which brings its own set of complexities yes, it does. because it, 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 in the same sense of, of Latino Hispanic communities, mm -hmm. this this sense that we are all sort of generic mm -hmm. Uh, based on uh, um, uh, racial uh, characteristics right. is, is completely false. Right, completely. And that's where the whole model minority myth came from. Right. People see certain groups of Asian Americans who have been here a lot longer than others and they see them succeeding. They see them, you know, they see crazy rich Asians now, it's in the movies, <laughs> and think that everybody's crazy rich and that's obviously not the case, especially here in the Central Although Valley. I'm willing to give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I were that crazy rich. <laughs> No, but we were really founded, um, we were founded actually as, a, it's kind of in the similar vein that uh, in the movement in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of women's groups, right, that were being active. And a lot of Asian Pacific um, professional women found that they were not being included in a lot of those conversations. And so CCAPW was founded sort of as a professional development and networking and support group for professional Asian Pacific women. It, and uh, it was really a place where people could feel free to bring their children along because as women we are always responsible for childcare even though you know we have all these other movements going on. But when it comes down to it, a lot of the times we are responsible for the childcare. And so I, you know, I wasn't around when they first began but you know, a lot of the women would bring their children and since then the children have grown up with the organization and are now 
serving on the board or they're now active in the organization. So over the years we have evolved. Uh, we have given out scholarships every, almost every year since the beginning and so over 38 years we have now given out over $205,000 in scholarships, all from monies that we've raised. Uh, but recently we've also taken on other issues. We've done workshops on uh, empowering women, on uh, leadership skills, on demographics, educating people about the different, the various demographics. And lately, in the last five years or so, we've been looking at domestic violence in the Asian Pacific American communities. And here in the Valley, because there's such a large Southeast Asian population, we've sort of focused on Southeast Asian and specifically Hmong American uh, for, this converse, for these conversations. And the Central California Women's Conference is, a, is another way to organize uh, work um, organize ideas, organize exchanges uh, amongst women. Um, Victoria, talk a little bit about the conferences that you organize and the organization that, that actually does put on these, these events. Sure, thank you very much. Well, the Central California Women's Conference began about 31 years ago. It was the brainchild of Ken Maddy, who thought there should be some ability um, and some more formal process for empowering women in the community, the Central Valley. Uh, we are now in our 31st year of putting on a one-day conference to empower women of, at all stages of their lives. Uh, in addition to that, we have been able to integrate other um, ways to give back. For example, um, we too give out every year scholarships. This has been a fairly new thing for, one, returning women to college, women who are returning to college, um, and it's very compelling stories. And uh, also to women, uh, young girls who are juniors or seniors in high school in the Central Valley. In addition to that, we give away every year to other nonprofit organizations. Central California Asian Pacific uh, Women's Group is one of them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have now, uh, just last year, given over a million dollars through our years of um, doing this. So the day is uh, set f out with a, a keynote speaker at lunchtime. Uh, over the years, we've had very prominent people. This year, we have uh, former California First Lady Maria Shriver. We're happy to have her. But in the past, we've had uh, Amy Purdy was last year, for example, the Paralympic skier. We try to have women uh, as keynotes who can come in and tell a story. Uh, maybe not everybody can relate to, but uh, certainly uh, understanding that uh, we all go through difficult times and coming through it is really the, the key and the difference of where people end up in life. During the day at the conference, we have 21 breakout sessions. So they cover various topics from uh, getting social security to dealing with the aging parents, with Alzheimer's, with um, being tech savvy to personal things such as how to stay fit when you're uh, fitting in fitness when you're an, a busy uh, working mom. So that's what we do. And then we have a warm up speaker. Uh, Deepak Chopra is going to be our warm up this year. Uh, similarly, we try to get a motivation, get in there. So it's a day of full empowerment for our women in the Valley. And then in addition to that, the money goes to help other women and children who aren't able to attend and who have needs. Um, the nonprofits we've had over the years um, have varied on social issues, on, on food, basic just getting food, to rape crisis centers, to Marjorie Mason Center, which is a place for domestic violence, um, to Girl Scouts of America. So we, uh, we have uh, multi-levels that we try to empower women and young girls. One of the things that I think is so interesting is that this is really about the communities forming themselves. Mm -hmm. They're self-defined communities. Each of these communities is self-defined. The second thing that I find so fascinating is the recognition of both success, very often personal success in the form of whoever is serving on the board, whoever is serving on the, on the uh, on the, uh, as, as the executives of these organizations, but also self-identification with those who have not yet made it to that, mm -hmm. that place. And then the third piece is the obligation of those who have succeeded to help those who are in the process of succeeding. Mm -hmm. And then converting that into a series of programs, counseling, groups, um, support, sometimes material support, as you've pointed out, Victoria, Sometimes it's, it's emotional support, um, as you've, as you've uh, described, Gina, or practical support in helping people navigate linguistic barriers, uh, uh, Brandy. But each, each place, you have people who are basically uh, bridge that gap 
between mm -hmm. the successful and the uh, in the process of being successful uh, members of society. How do you ensure that you're that that what you're doing has the impact that you desire? You don't have high overhead organizations. Mm -hmm. You don't have uh, a bunch of staff who are running around with clipboards or or um, or iPads, sort of taking down data. How do you know? that what you're doing, Gina, is, is actually having the impact that you desire? I guess, yeah, we don't really, we don't necessarily have the clipboards. We definitely don't have staff. Mm -hmm. um, but what we can do is we can see our impact when we hear back from our scholarship recipients and say, you know, because of your scholarship, I was able to attend this college that I thought was out of my reach, or I was able to buy that lab equipment that I didn't think I was going to be able to afford and so I was able to major in this, you know, whatever class it was. And so when we hear back, you know, it really does uh, make an impact on us because we know that uh, our scholarship monies are being used for very, very valuable things that maybe it, without it that student would not have had that opportunity. We do a favor, well not favor, but we, one of our, a couple of our criteria are that the people that we give our scholarships to are very low income and they're often usually the first, among the first generation in their families to attend college. And so with those criteria, we know that those people don't really have other outside resources. And perhaps without that extra push from our organization, maybe they wouldn't go to college. Maybe they would take a part-time job, you know, in order to make, meet expenses and help their families or whatnot. And so when we see um, our scholarship winners, you know, graduating from college and coming back, oftentimes they do come back and contact us. Many, many of them do come back and eventually serve on our board, and that really helps to fuel our you know, motivation and our desire to continue to do what we do. And Brandy, how do you know that you're successful? With like the small programs that we do or the educational lunches we provide, I mean, it never fails when they'll come up to us and say, you know what, I got so much out of this, how can I get more information? Um, so we know that we're bringing valuable uh, speakers and good resources to the members. Uh, I would say with our events that we do, the conference style events, when the vendors sit there and say, you know what, I closed two deals while I was here for three hours. And, you know, that's what we want them to get out of it is, you know, return on investment, of course, and uh, make those connections. So um, we last year did a um, survey to all of our membership saying, what can the chamber do? You know, what have we done well? So we asked various questions and the top thing that they wanted to see was more networking. Mm. So we just recently partnered with a um, networking group called ResCom, and we have now blended our lunches that happen every third Thursday of the month. And um, so their membership comes to our lunches and there is just networking happening. We make sure that we have networking for about 15 minutes before the lunch. Um, so it's been a great partnership. And again, with that, people just coming up to the board and shaking our hands saying, Thank you for this. So that's how we really gauge if we're doing a good job and also uh, the survey. We're all human beings, right? Yeah. We all want to spend our time wisely and we all seek out positive reinforcement. Yeah. Okay. Um, and if we're spending time and we're spending money and we're, we're, we're and, and people come up to us uh, and they say nice things, well, there might be a hundred people out there who don't think that it was that great. Mm -hmm. But three people say nice things, and, those, and, the, and we repeat the yeah. story of the three people. How do we know that what we're doing is actually having impact? How do we measure the results? Looking at you know our budgets constantly with everything we do, um, are we getting more people month to month at our events? Is it going down? Why? What's our priority? Um, what does our priorities really look like? I have an idea of what the priorities of the chamber should look like as president, but looking at the bird's eye view of what's happening with our membership. I mean, we really had to tie it down and we did uh, the top four priorities of the chamber and being realistic, is that happening? No. So we, we do, we recognize th those things are not happening. Um, that's pretty much how we're getting the gauge on if we are being impactful, so. And Gina, how do you know? Well, I was gonna use the example for um, of, our, of our work in domestic violence in the area of that. We decided to take, to take on that work because we didn't see anyone else doing it. And we knew it was not gonna be a popular move. We knew that we were gonna have a lot of critics, most likely. Um, and we knew that there was probably gonna be a little bit of pushback from the community, especially 
if we're going to focus on the Hmong community, then the Hmong community might say, who is this group that's claiming to speak for us, right? And they're not going to really um, want to engage with us, especially if we came to at it with the idea or with the attitude that we're going to tell you what's best for your community. And so we were very, very conscious and very uh, mindful of not taking that attitude. And so we very, very carefully selected a few people that in the Hmong American community that we knew um, understood our intent and understood what we were trying to do is just to open up the conversation. And, and with our very, you know, for our first forum, we kept it very small purposely because we didn't want a lot of outside voices kind of taking over our agenda and you know, using it as a forum to blare their criticism or whatever it was. And so we, we, we knew we were in it for at least five years and so we did a very small effort first. And with that, we kind of built you know, the trust and hopefully got a little bit more, um, uh, I guess, yeah, I guess it's trust really on the part of other Hmong American leaders, of other people who work in the system, uh, worked as you know, maybe social service, social workers, domestic violence advocates, and kind of very slowly built our networks out from that first meeting to then the last one that we had was a public uh, forum and we actually had students attending too. And one of the students actually felt, um, I guess she was so impacted by some of the presentations that were being made that she actually came forward and requested to speak to um, one of our board members who happens to be a licensed psychologist uh, to tell her that she was actually having issues herself at home. And so just knowing that people felt safe in that environment, that we created the space for these kinds of issues to come out, I think makes us feel like this, this work really is needed. And even if there are criticisms out there, somebody needs to take the step and, and be a leader, I guess, in, you know, in making this, these conversations happen. And Victoria, um, how, how do you know that you're being successful? Well, <clears throat> first of all, we are five women on the board. We're all professional women, high executive, um, people who are um, very successful but feel the need and the obligation, because it's what's in their heart, to give back to the community. And I think that's what you're going to find with the, the young ladies next to me as well. Uh, this is, um, it's always been on my heart to help young women. And um, I was honored to be asked to be on the board. I guess every board loved to have a lawyer there, but um, uh, these amazing women. And what I have seen on my years on the board is this. One, um, certainly our event was sold out earlier than ever this year. Um, we're only limited by capacity. Um, we have the largest venue here in Fresno, and that's the only thing that limits us. So we know that is one marker. Uh, we're pretty much always sold out or close to it by the end of each year. So that's good. What we've also done, though, is with our grant program, um, it's been really amazing. Approximately six years ago, the, the grant recipients, those who are going to receive whatever money we have left over after the conference, um, which has now constituted a little over a million dollars, uh, we have an event where we hand out the money. But what we do is before where we just send them the money, we actually have a reception. And the purpose of that reception initially was to get everybody there and um, honor them. They're the people in the trenches. They're the ones that are doing the work. But what came out of that was so amazing in that you could have an organization that gives um, toothbrushes and toothpaste to um, farm laborers, uh, children out in the fields. Those people running that organization met somebody else who um, provided some other service that their people could use. So it was this wonderful synergistic effect of people understanding that there are other resources out there because maybe somebody who is doing a nonprofit is only in one little area, handing out toothbrush and toothpaste. But you've got another organization that helps with getting food, or another organization, a rape crisis center, those various um, avenues. And um, it's a good problem, but the board is the one who does the due diligence on the people who ask for the grants. And we have so many, it takes us about two days, in addition to getting all the paperwork ready first, to go through. We do our due diligence, we do the presentation, and all we wish is we had more money to give out. And that number has grown so much. That's also how we know, one, that there's a great need out there. There are people in the trenches, and they need the resources. They're on um, their grassroots efforts sometimes. As high, they could be something more than just a grassroots. We have all, all levels, but we 
make sure that we are helping those in the very fundamental. A grandmother's house, uh, it's called Grandma's House, it's where kids come to get um, free tutoring for math in the out, outskirts of Fresno area where they may not get it otherwise, a safe environment for the children. Um, so it, it varies, but we see the great need for it, and so we believe we're successful based upon that. And uh, as a recipient, can I just add? Yes. We are so grateful that a group like Central California Women's Conference is giving out these grants. I mean, they're not huge grants, right? They're, they're not. They're not mm -hmm. but big, but they do uh, service a certain niche. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of very small uh, startup organizations that are able to get grants from you guys that are not able to get them from maybe the Fresno Regional Foundation or... Mm -hmm. Irvine Foundation, you know, because they're not large enough. They haven't been around long enough. They don't have the track record, but the Central California Women's Conference is able to kind of get take a chance and give a small grant right. to these very small organizations. And so, yeah, I'm very grateful that we're one of the organizations, too. The other thing we do, Mark, on the other end is when someone has been a recipient, they have to report back to us what mm -hmm. they've done with their money. And um, we try to give non-restrictive funds because a lot of organizations can get restrictive mm -hmm. funds, but it only has to be for X, Y, or Z. And we yeah. like to, it to be, because it is smaller, that it is something that can have an impact there. It's not you know, the $1,500 for the kitchen that they need to remodel where the kids come after school so they can have something nutritious to eat. We understand that won't kind of get there. So we try to give it as an unrestrictive mm -hmm. if possible um, so that they can use it where they find the need. These are the people with their boots on the ground. What I find to be very inter uh, interesting is that these are completely distinct mm -hmm. uh, areas of endeavor, but you're actually using your, your training for um, one purpose. So you're coming at this from different perspectives. How does being a litigator help <laughs> you? Someone who makes arguments, makes cases, puts together evidence, how does that help you? How does that inform your work as a nonprofit leader? Sure. Um, well, mostly what I do, and, and I'm on a couple boards, and, and usually it's because they want a lawyer to look over some contracts and uh, give some advice when we have to sign contracts for our speaker, for our vendors, for the place where we are um, So located. you're doing an in-kind contribution as part of your, of your activities? It's, that's true, but I will say this. Um, those who do get asked a lot, and um, I make sure, and, and the reason I'm on the Central California Women's, at least I chose that as, as part of where I was going to put my extra time after a very busy uh, week at work and having a family, um, is because I believe in what they do. I do see the impact. I do see, uh, I want to say the success of it, but I see it making a difference. And it's where my heart is. Uh, Margaret Mead had a saying, I, I might mess it up, but never doubt that a group of concerned citizens um, can make a difference. In fact, it's the only thing that ever does. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I follow and, and get the joy that I get out of doing this and being a part of it and seeing the difference it makes in people's lives. And Gina, you have so many different experiences you also mm -hmm. teach. Mm -hmm. How does that inform the work that you do? I guess I can see, um, when I'm not originally from Fresno. I moved here from Los Angeles and about 10 years ago. And when I moved here, I noticed that there wasn't a lot of nonprofit, there weren't a lot of nonprofit organizations in the area. And I just kind of looked around and asked myself, why is that? And even I looked around in the Asian Pacific American community and I didn't see a whole lot of organizations there either. And so that's kind of how I found um, CCAPW as, a, as this pan-Asian women's organization, even though it's all volunteer, I saw that it has this potential to make inroads in all these different areas. You know, even though it started off as a professional networking group, they give scholarships and now we're doing domestic violence forums. Uh, and so I can, I just have this, I guess I myself have this need to, to always give back and to improve the community that I'm in um, and to surround myself with like-minded people. And I think that's kind of where our groups sort of have all maybe have something in common where we've found this sense of community in the Central California Women's Conference in the Hispanic Chamber in, in CCAPW. And I, I just think that, you, like your quote says, you know, we have another quote in the Chinese community says, strong women can move mountains. <laughs> and I really love that one because, you know, even though we're not paid, we're all volunteers, if we all kind of unite around a common goal, we, and our board has very different strengths too, we can all move together towards that goal and, and accomplish things that we never really thought we could do individually, especially. And Brandy, in terms of in terms of your professional um, activities and how that informs what you're doing, I mean, you're you are a natural connector. You're yeah. in sales. You connect people to products and services. Mm -hmm. How does that inform? 
Yeah, you know, I've been in advertising, uh, marketing for about over 15 years now. So when I actually got asked to be on the board, I had no idea what Chambers of Commerce did, to be honest with you. Um, and when I sat there with very high level professionals, um, you know, decision makers, it really opened my eyes and I just learned so much throughout the years. I've been involved with this chamber since 2007. Um, so this is my fifth term really engaging in, in holding a, um, an executive position. So I actually did secretary, treasurer, <laughs> VP, and now I'm, I'm president. And um, it's been such a learning experience. But yes, using my skills in connecting with people, cultivating relationships um, has really helped our chamber you know, build partnerships and um, uh, talk with donors. And, um, and I think it helps as also as you can imagine, running a board, you know, I run a board of 12 and um, different personalities, you know, it's, it's challenging sometimes, but um, it, it's been quite the learning experience and I could not have asked for a better role and um, that volunteer spirit definitely opened up, you know, back in 2007 and um, like us, we just have a passion for what we do and um, where I work keeps me in front of the business community, so the stars aligned two years ago when I got voted in <laughs> to be president. Yeah. So community building, movement building, mm -hmm. direct services, yep. providing a path to prosperity. Mm -hmm. right. I'd like to thank you all for sharing the work of Central California Women's Conference, Victoria oh. Bernhardt, Gina Lugong of the Central California Asian Pacific Women, mm -hmm and Brandy Carpenter of Central California Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much for your services to the community, and thank you so much for your insights. Thanks. Thank, thank you for having us. Thank you for having us.